everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Joao Marcel Grillo. I'm a mental health nurse, and I'm really pleased to uh, welcome you all to today's um, webinar, uh, which is entitled Bridging the Gap and Driving the Momentum. And as most of you probably know, this is the second webinar in the Nightingale Challenge Global Solutions Initiative series, um, focusing on supporting a newly uh, registered nurses as they transition uh, from the role of being students to being practitioners to being uh, leaders a challenge that is uh, being done uh, by nursing now uh, in partnership with uh, giant mental health which is the organization i i work for we have a really large and great number of speakers and, and of, of people in our panel today. I think Hannah, the Nursing Night Communication Officer, just said that it's probably the webinar where it had the biggest number of, of speakers. So that's uh, really exciting. And, and it's people from, you know, everybody's a nurse or a midwife, and, but from very different parts of the world. And I think with very different, uh, very different experiences as well. So uh, I think that's gonna make this, this webinar really um, interesting. Um, I'll, I'll briefly introduce them to everyone at home, although then you individually can tell a little bit more about yourselves when, when you, you, you join the chat. Um, we have to start with Professor uh, Lisa uh, Bailey's Pratt, who is the Nightingale Challenge uh, Program uh, Director. We have Dr. Rhoda Radula, who is Director of the Magnet Program at the Vial Co uh, Cornell Medical Center in, in America who will talk to us about the importance of uh, nurturing newly qualified nurses to improve retention and the quality of care on offer to patients. Um, and then we'll move on to a series of different uh, presentations from nurses and midwives who will share their experiences and approach models to support nurses in the transition phase that we've been talking uh, throughout this, this, this challenge in our first webinar and now on the second webinar. So we've got people like Sarah Abel, who is the Director of Educational Resources, Global Initiatives and Marketplace. We've got Matt Daly, who is a Practice Development Nurse for Career Progression from the Surrey and Sussex Healthcare NHS Trust in the UK. We've got uh, Jess Sainsbury, also uh, in the UK, Research and Policy Assistance from the Florence Nightingale uh, Foundation. All the way from Spain, we've got uh, Leticia Bernues, who is a registered nurse. Um, and all the way from Uganda, we've got Harriet Nayaga, who is a midwife and also founder of the uh, Milcott uh, organization. We also have uh, Charlotte Jacob Hall, who is a safe care specialist nurse from Gloucestershire Hospital NHS Foundation, also in the UK. So we have all these great speakers to tell us about um, various different approaches, various different models that have been successful in and used in this uh, in, to support nurses in this transition process from being a student to being registered nurses. And then we'll move on, on to uh, uh, talking about how we can use uh, the international attention and support that terrible pandemic has brought to the nursing profession, how we can use that to, to drive the nursing leadership agenda. And for that, we have uh, um, four people joining us uh, on our panel, all great advocates uh, for, for nurses and midwives. Uh, we've got Ariane Patiwi, we've got Monashe Nyaka, we've got Billy Rosa, all the way from New York, and we've got uh, Zephora Iregi. Uh, and obviously what we would really like is that in addition to, uh, you know, listening to uh, this uh, great panel discussion that people at home, that you send us your comments, your thoughts, your questions uh, on the chat box. And obviously there will be a question and answers uh, um, kind of slot in the end. So we'll try to answer as many questions as, as we can, but please join the conversation. Um, before actually we get started, uh, I just wanted to very, very briefly remind everyone what the challenge is actually about. Um, so in the first webinar, uh, we explained to participants that you'll have the opportunity to choose one of, of two challenges. 
Um, a, you can identify ways in which experiences can support early career nurses as they transition from student to registered nurse or to, to midwives. Or B, you can develop an approach to support nurses as they transition from student to registered nurse. Uh, the deadline is the 4th of June, so uh, do send us do send us your your um, your your projects, your proposals uh, over the next couple of weeks, um, and and we hope to announce the winners uh, relatively soon after. And the price, the tickets will be the the, the reward will be tickets to the um, ICN Congress, uh, which will take place in November. Uh, this year, uh, for obvious reasons, is uh, it's going to be an online event. Uh, but uh, no less interesting. Um, now, uh, we're incredibly fortunate that today's webinar coincides with International Nurses Day. So happy International Nurses Day to everyone, uh, whether you're a nurse or not, um, which is celebrated on the 12th of May. I think it's because today is the birthday of Florence Nightingale. Um, so let's start with a special message from uh, Professor Bailey's Pratt, which is herself a champion for nurses and midwives, both uh, at home and overseas. So, Professor well, Bailey's Pratt, over to you. Oh, thank you so very much. Um, and it's so wonderful to be here with you on International Nurses Day with this amazing panel. I just can't believe, you know, we, we didn't know each other. We didn't even know about this agenda two years ago. And here we are assembled talking to great people from all sorts of different places over the world. So I just want to say a huge thank you for being part of this amazing, amazing global movement that's just building and building. Um, this morning I've spoken at uh, two organisations for International Nurses Day, both of which who are championing early career nurses in the Nightingale Challenge. And I also want to say a huge thank you, and I think I've seen her in the chat box as well, to Rhoda that's somewhere on the screen um, from New York, who, who was so amazing yesterday, um, sharing with us her fantastic nurses and their passion and commitment to, to excellent professional nursing practice. So I think without further ado, I'll, I'll hand back over to you, but thanks again so much for everything you do and being part of this amazing network. Long may it continue and big may it get. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lisa. Um, so, um, Rhoda Radula, over to you. I know that you're going to tell us a little bit about the importance of nurturing uh, um, early career nurses and the impact that that can have uh, on both retention of staff and quality of care. So over to you. Thank you so much, Joe and um, Lisa, and happy International Nurses Day to everyone. My name is Rhoda Radulia. I'm the Magnet Program Director here in New York, New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Medical Center and Gracie Square Hospital. I'm also an assistant professor of clinical nursing at Columbia University and a contributing faculty for DNP and PhD programs at Walden University. I speak today from the voice of a Magnet Program Director who has oversight of our journey to nursing excellence. And I have supported several organizations and led the journey in successful designations here in, in my hospital and other organizations. I also speak from the voice of nursing professional development in my previous roles and also currently chairing the Society of Gastroenterology Nurses and Associates Education Committee. I have worked closely with newly qualified, new to practice nurses and as a nursing faculty who has seen and supervised many students from undergraduate and graduate level. And lastly, I speak today from a voice of a nurse immigrant who was born and raised and was schooled in the Philippines as a nursing student and moved to a new country, transitioning. And really this topic today resonates so much with me. I was a new to practice nurse, not only, not I was a new to practice nurse in my own country, but I felt like a new to practice nurse when I transitioned to the United States.
So imposter syndrome, does this sound familiar to you? I will never forget the first time I stepped onto a ward as a nursing student in my freshly ironed new uniform. Everything was going well. This was it. I was living my dream. And then an older woman called out for a nurse, looked at me and I froze. I wasn't a real nurse. So what on earth was I to do? This was written by an author, Dave Calder, from a student perspective. But really, in reality, this is not just, imposter syndrome is not just something that nursing students go through. According to evidence, 70% 70, 70 of people, including you and me, at some point in our lives have feelings of the imposter syndrome. But what is this? It creates feelings of self-doubting individuals. There's a feeling of emotional paralysis that you can't seem to function, like function in any way first. And, and other days you cannot, you seem to not be able to reach your, 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 your full potential because it's a barrier. And what can we do? What can we do here as a global community? What can we do as, as a nursing community to support the newly qualified nurse and address imposter syndrome and really nurture their development. I have outlined here four main buckets of how to support our newly qualified nurses. One is a comprehensive orientation program. And we will break this down in a little bit, really more in detail. A nurse residency program where nurses get the support during the first six months to 12 months of their time in, an, in the organization as a new to practice or newly qualified nurse. And after that, a continuing mentorship program where they get guidance, not only with the day-to-day -day life as a clinical nurse or whatever setting they are in, but a mentorship program that gives them the long view of nursing and what their journey will look like and getting that support. And very important, this grade is not complete without an appropriately supported, successful, strong preceptor program. Because we don't want our nurses, our newly qualified nurses to end this way. And even in an, any given day, you know, any nurses, newly qualified or not, can end up like this. We, you know, you and I have been in clinical, in the clinical setting where we are just dealing with multiple, almost insurmountable stimuli. How much more for the newly qualified or new to practice nurse who's just learning to navigate some days just learning where their locker is or how to find, you know, how to find something in, in the unit, not knowing the code for something to get through the door or the medication room. And these are all the realities that are happening. And just sharing with you, I'll pause with a story that uh, a few weeks ago, I was in conversation with one of my dear friends who has, whose daughter is um, a new nurse. She just, she was finishing orientation, I think, or she just got out of orientation. So I was just texting and I think I called her and I, I, I asked like how she was doing, how her daughter was doing, who's, you know, like family to me. And she said that, oh, well, she um, is now officially on her own. Terrified, right? Terrified, it's like her first week and I got a phone call. She said, I got the first phone call from her. She was also at work and this was the phone call. He said, mom, mom, she was in the bathroom in the hospital, mom, what will I do? And said like, what will you do? Why, what's happening? She said, well, my patient's family member is here and she is so angry and mad and dissatisfied and I just don't know how to go back and talk to her. And so, of course, she guided her. She said, well, take a deep breath, you know, go back to the room and, you know, like gave her 
guidance, but that is just really a clear picture of what new to practice nurses can deal with day to day. And even any of us experienced nurses, we can be terrified too. How much more to them? Another one that she shared is that, well, next week she's also scared because she, it will be her first time to go on the night shift. So all these transitions are happening so fast. And the question is what support are we giving to them and how are we preparing them right in nursing school and right there when they are at our doorstep, right? So let's try to break it down. I probably have like five minutes at this point, but first let's talk about general nursing orientation. The goal is to provide as competent nurses as possible. Ensure that a new employee or new nurses are familiarized with the working environment, you know, the physical layout of the unit, who to call, where to call, who to go to, and also being familiar with the demands and expectations, which honestly, I don't think that there's any way to communicate that in, in a succinct way. That will be an ongoing process. But if I may just add here, the overall goal of general nursing orientation is to support the newly qualified nurse so that they come back to work the next day. We want them to be confident, competent, because this is our goal. The overall goal is also to give the best possible care to our patients, quality and safe care. So let's look at set the essentials of orientation, which are all aligned to supporting the newly qualified nurse. Preparation is key. The didactic portion, you know, the lecture portion is probably one, but it is a small portion of what we can do for them. But looking at high risk, low risk competencies, you know, we have orientation checklists, really comprehensive checklists of what they need to do depending on the, in the, on the area. Are they working in a medical surgical unit? Are they working in an ambulatory setting? In the community setting, what are these essentials? And the common diagnostic, the diagnosis, the common procedures, common medications. How about the second bucket here, incorporation? That is very important. They should be welcomed and incorporated into the team as early as possible into morning huddles, meetings, introducing them to each shift. Don't assume that the next shift knows them. Nurse manager or the supervisor check in with them regularly is so important. No news is good news is not applicable in this case. Okay? We have to check in and actively purposely check in with them. Next is goal-directed precepting. I have a couple of slides to talk about this. And that means, you see here, it's goal-directed. There should be clear goals of what are their opportunities, primary needs and opportunities for, for, for growth and improvement. This very much reminds us of Patricia Banner's theory of novice, the expert, right? How do we effectively approach and support our new nurses with those basic competencies to be able to get through, not just the next hour or the, the current patient you're looking at, but really on a continuing basis. The ongoing support is also essential, and I have more about that later. Very important is direct and timely two-way feedback. And I cannot stress this enough. I have been I have had the opportunity to lead a preceptor program um, in, in my previous roles and um, had the opportunity to really look at how to strengthen preceptor programs uh, really with the orientee, with the new nurse at the front and center of our conversations. And one of the key and the best practices is making sure to integrate a standard communication protocol. Frequency, how frequent is that? What are the things that are going to be talked about? And there are tools that can be used to, to do this. There, there's a lot of evidence and work that has done to support our preceptors and that feedback process. Here, behind a successful nurse warranty is an excellent and a strong preceptor and you will agree with me on that. 
But what are the barriers sometimes? As leaders, there needs to be time and support provided for both orientee and the preceptor to be in support sessions, whether it's in the nurse residency program, whether it is part of an orientation program or a continuing program, or that weekly communication that's occurring within the preceptor orientation process. Time constraint is always you know, an issue or poor preparation of the preceptor. Do they even know what they are supposed to focus on as preceptors? Are they updated on the procedures, policies, and guidelines that they are supposed to be going over with their orientee? And a lot of other barriers which we need to be thinking about. I lead the magnet recognition program at my organization and magnet recognition program and pathway to excellence of the American Nurses Credentialing Center are models of excellence. And embedded through these programs are standards that prompt the organization for successful transition to practice. And it's very specific. You need to meet these standards. New to practice nurse, experienced nurse, advanced practice nurse, you need to demonstrate that you have a mentoring and a succession planning program, clinical nurse level at the front line, nurse manager, and so forth. And the same with the preceptor program. If you see this magnet model here, it, this too fall, falls under these two domains, structural empowerment from the word empower and transformational leadership, prompting that leaders have a big role in making sure that our nurses are successful. I'm getting close to the end and I know I have a few minutes, but these are other stru structures that organizations here and globally can do and adopt. We have our fellowship programs here at um, our, my own organization. We have a chief nurse fellows program where our nurses are, this is sponsored by our very own chief nursing officer where nurses, it's a very selective process but they have the opportunity and given protected time to pursue quality improvement projects and evidence-based practice projects that they're passionate about. We also have Quality Improvement Academy Fellows, which is a partner, a partnership program with our College of Medicine, uh, where our nurses go in classes in the program alongside our physicians. And we also have Academic Practice Research Fellows. Shared governance, I cannot speak about enough involving our nurses as early as possible in the shared decision-making through the unit council, hospital councils, being part of a professional nursing organization outside the hospital and so forth, and developing them as experts through specialty certification. So sharing with you something that uh, Professor Lisa Bailey Pratt saw yesterday at our Nightingale Challenge program in Storyslam, we unveiled the traveling journal. This is our, you see here the red one in the middle. We, uh, in 2020, May 2020, we launched the journey of a traveling journal, the leather bound journal, where it journeyed across the hospital from one unit to the next. And many of our, early, early, our new to practice and new to qualified nurses were there. You know, they were there. They were just like one and two months and they were right into the, the, the thick of caring for COVID patients in, you know, in, the, in the middle of the pandemic. And you can see here their thoughts and reflections, two of which were actually published as a Nurses Week special in the New York newspaper. And it was just beyond moving. In 2020, the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife, the World Health Organization made this declaration that nurses and midwives play a vital role in providing health services. These are the people who devote their lives to caring for mothers and children, giving life-saving immunizations and health advice, looking after older people and generally meeting everyday essential health needs. They are often the first and only point of care in their communities. And this is why it is important to support our nurses of the future. Just last, yesterday, hot off the press, the Future of Nursing 2020-2030 report was released, charting a path to achieve health equity. And I invite you to read this with me. 
This is part of the dedication and the front, first front pages of the report. This report is dedicated to the nurses around the world who paid the ultimate price of caring for people during the COVID-19 crisis of 2020, 2021. Hundreds lost their lives and many thousands became sick themselves. And those who escaped the physical symptoms of the illness did not necessarily escape the physical and mental toll of working long hours in grueling circumstances, sometimes without proper PPE. Your dedication and persistence in the face of adversity saved countless lives. They were also there to ease the suffering of the dying with a handheld, a song sung or a video call to loved ones. For them, we look to the future of nursing to help ensure that what happened to the nursing profession this year and those in their care, especially the disadvantaged and the people of color becomes an event of the past. And friends, fellow nurses, this is the future of nursing report, a challenge for all of us in the next decade, but who is the future of nursing? It's our newly qualified early career nurses. Thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rodula. Um, we were getting a lot of comments on the uh, comments box of people just from so many different parts of the world just saying how they could relate to the uh, um, imposter syndrome that you were talking about earlier on. And you mentioned a lot mentorship, which is something as well that has often come, come, um, come out in, in, in a lot of the conversations that we had in the past uh, with nurses from all over the world where mentorship doesn't exist in so many different countries. The concept of mentorship doesn't exist. So it's encouraging on one hand to see such a well-structured program uh, in the US. And I hope that people in other countries can think also about these ideas and, and the context that they work in and, and how can structures like this, governance frameworks and support systems can be developed in, in, in their countries. So thank you very, very much. Um, Sarah Abel, I'll, I'll move to Sarah, if that's okay, uh, director of the Magnet Programme. And, and the Wale Cornell Medical Center. I think what we're going to uh, hear now, uh, Sarah, before, before I, I let you start, is we're going to hear about different examples of approaches of modules um, that can support uh, newly registered nurses uh, to become confident practitioners and, and leaders. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. And yes, how do I follow that last reading? I mean, you know, uh, we certainly have all been moved by the sacrifices that um, all of the nursing profession has made in the last year and a half. I want to start off by just giving a few statistics on um, research that has really supported the development of the program that Sigma has to offer. So um, my name is Dr. Sarah Abel, and I am the director of um, Global Initiatives, the Marketplace and Educational Resources for Sigma Theta Tau International. Um, the previous research has established that 57% of new graduates will leave their first position within the second year of practice, or by the second year of practice. We know that those high turnover rates certainly have impact on staff morale, work productivity, patient outcomes, and certainly the cost of healthcare across the globe. We also know that those residency mentor and preceptor programs that are really robust and really great at some organizations are still lacking in many other organizations and settings that are still hiring those new grads. So we still have a gap and it's gonna be probably a long time before those residency mentor and preceptor programs are part of every organization and institutions um, you know, framework. Sigma has developed a program designed to transition students into practice, discussing many of the tips and tricks that nurses really wish that they would have known earlier on in their career. Many Sigma of Sigma's programs, just like this one, are mapped to the key competencies and standards such as QSIN or Pathways to Excellence. We take great pride in the quality of our programming, even though they're online programs and oftentimes those can be a, a little dreary to click through or we hit play and we walk away. We know that Sigma's programs are interactive um, and engaging on many levels. Learners can pick and choose from the six different courses offered, or they can take the entire program. So maybe they don't aren't struggling with a particular area right now, but they may be in the future. 
Sigma's program is interactive with the knowledge checks, case studies, branching scenarios, which is like a choose your own adventure kind of um, scenario, and then drag and drop type activities. So some of the um, course titles that we have in our program, the first one being transitioning from student to professional nurse. One of the key topics that I really appreciate in this uh, particular course is the value of networking. We know that socialization into the profession is a key ingredient to the retention of nurses. Uh, another course in the program is legal risks. As a nurse, we also know that there are significant legal risks that student nurses and, and pre-licensure nurses don't even realize. Dr. Radula actually mentioned dealing with disruptive patients during the practice. And that happens to also be one of the modules that we have within this program, dealing with disruptive patients and families is exactly the title. That's not often something that they have a lot of experience with. And that is one of the areas that we have those branching scenarios where they can actually decide what would they respond with? How would they, what would they say back to the patient um, that was angry and really give them some, you know, uh, low risk experience with some of those um, um, difficult conversations. Another uh, course is advancing your nursing career. We know that a lot of nursing pre-licensure students and as they begin to get that first degree, we know that they're wanting to go directly back into school and get some advanced degrees, but there is a lot more to nursing than just the higher degrees. And higher degrees are great, um, but there's also joining nursing associations, of course, that can provide a network of colleagues to provide that framework of support that they don't even know that they need yet, attending conferences, continuing education programs and certifications. Social media for healthcare providers is another course within our program. We know that um, a lot of organizations and, and systems have adopted a social media policy for their staff, but there's a lot of other information. COVID has um, actually come, brought to light false information and nurses need to know how to identify where that false information is coming from and maybe where to find the right information, as well as what to post and not to post, of course. And the final uh, course in our program is Bullying in the Workplace, Solutions for Nursing Practice. We know that uh, a study actually here in the US, it was 60% of nurses leave their job or have an intent to leave their job due to bullying in the workplace within the first six months of their profession. There's studies based in China and the UK where the prevalence of bullying range from 80 to 96%, which is astounding numbers. Another study based in the Middle East said that the abuse type was 13% physical, 73% verbal, and 40% racial. I just don't think that our students are really prepared to handle that kind of onslaught of, uh, of bullying. So that program also contains branching scenarios where they get real experience in having those discussions, um, you know, in a safe environment to start, because that's where we, we know that we need to, to give them that kind of uh, safe space to practice in. So, uh, and I'll put in the, the, the chat as well where you can find this program. Um, it is free if, any, if anyone is a Sigma member, it is free to Sigma members um, and it can be bought, bought in, in, a, in a bulk uh, pricing as well. So if you have any interest in that program, highly recommend it. Even if you have um, a program designed where you have the, the residency mentor and preceptor programs already available, this is a good adjunct and, and gives them some additional resources at their fingertips. So. Thank you so much for letting us showcase one of our resources for this um, essential and vulnerable population. Thank you very much, Sarah. I have to follow up because I read your title and workplace incorrectly, so I'm sorry about that. It's, it's Director of Educational Resources, Initiatives and Marketplace. And I was going to ask you something that you've just answered, which was, uh, where could we find these, these courses? Because obviously you're talking from the US, but it just sounds so useful in so many different contexts that it's it's really good to know that if you are a member of Sigma, you can you can purchase them and access them, right? Yes, absolutely. And um, anybody can access them. And I will say another um, key component, you know, Sigma is a global organization and therefore our courses are intended to meet the needs of our global audience. So certainly uh, just specific to the US, 
and many of our authors and reviewers of the program um, and people taking the program are from all over the world. So um, we, there are some specific nuances, obviously, so as you can see from just my references, we make sure that we really have the global applicability. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And it's really important, isn't it, that these programs are um, quite structured, but at the same time, they're flexible enough to be adapted to the culture where they can be implemented. That's that's uh, a really plus as well. In this sort of approach. Each other, right? mm, exactly, exactly. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, I'll move on, if, if that's OK, to Matt Daly. Matt, you're in the UK um, working for Surrey and Sussex. Um, NHS Foundation Trust. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the approach and the model that you want to present to us today? Yes, certainly. One second. I'll just quickly show very short. Here we go. Too bad. Okay, so hi, my name is Matt Daly. Uh, practice development nurse at here at Surrey and Sussex uh, Healthcare NHS Trust, and my focus is on the early, on the career progression of early career nurses. And I'd like to share how we actually support in these newly qualified nurses as they transition from theory to practice and beyond. So Surrey and Sussex Healthcare NHS Trust is close by to Gatwick Airport and the M25 motorway in the Surrey and Sussex border in South, tucked away in South East England. Um, although it's very small um, and are tucked away, we have a nursing population of around 1,500 nurses, but 33% of our staff are from the international nursing community, um, a very large amount, um, which presents us with the absolute pleasure of welcoming and developing newly qualified nurses from around the world and those yet to undertake the OSCE examinations so they, can, so they actually join the NMC register. And like many healthcare op um, organizations, our priorities really are the integration, the investment, the retention, and the longer term development of our you know, qualified and early career nurses that join us. So it's very much a journey and we start from best start and we, what we really want to achieve is that balanced leader. So from the beginning, we put in the effort to provide the best start and join them, uh, integrating them into the hospital and for international colleagues, uh, preparing them to take the OSCE examinations um, that we help prepare them, we train them through, to join us as their registered nurses and become their development journey, so joining uh, our newly qualified uh, nurses. From here, they're introduced, and we mentioned about how do we get them ready. So they're introduced and orientated to the hospital processes and practices. Um, via ward ready by our practice development nurses who come from the wards um, and here they first meet their line managers and their senior leaders along this path and introduce the support available to them so it's really really integrating really making them part of uh, part of the family i suppose part of the nursing family um, then they continue their journey um, and they're enrolled in the Perceptive Programme, which is a blending learning programme with subject matter experts uh, in face-to-face -face sessions, online learning, uh, independent study, clinical supervision, and with practice-based feedback and documented reflection. So we're, we're following the journey through with them and um, preparing them, but giving them yeah, a good experience all the way around. The programme itself consists of patient management, clinical safety, um, including an introduction to simulation training as well. We're very keen to get that into them so they're, they're not scared when it comes to later on in their career. And also resource management, prioritisation and a lot of clinical subjects including safe patient care, uh, safe patient transfer and end of life care. Then. As they've done this, they're starting to really step into the first leadership roles. Uh, so we provide nurse in charge development, which is their first um, ward shift taking on as team leaders, really. Um, so that content uh, consists, again, of subject matter experts, because we really want them to really understand the actual um, 
subjects. So they're coached in things like safeguarding, human factors training, discharge planning, electronic records, managing complaints. So we want to make sure, you know, that they we're preparing them as best as they can be. Um, and also, uh, sorry, yeah, so management complaints and also social media management as well, um, all of which is supported with the competency document and, and really enables them to proficiently lead the ward shift. Um, and and, that, and they're, they're walking that leadership path already. Um, and they can be fairly new to the, to the trust. So that then brings them to the Springboard program, which is a four month program of coaching and development, me developmental mentoring um, in leadership, healthcare process improvement, um, personal and team resilience and support within the workplace, um, as well as attendance and involvement in senior meeting, uh, senior management meetings and activities, and also multiple shadowing opportunities because what I'm or myself, I'm, I'm very keen for them to do is to experience the hospital outside of their four walls of the nurse. Um, nurses like being in boxes for some reason. They start off, um, they come into the big hospital, they start off on a, uh, with a couple of patients, then the ward, um, and as they go through their boxes get bigger, whereas I want to break down the borders so they can actually understand the whole picture and actually really appreciate what is going on and why things happen. Um, and the relationships as well. So they start to see how the relationships form between um, different um, different teams, etc. So they can see that really well. Um, from there, it culminates. So at the end of the program, it culminates in development and implementation of either a, um, of a chosen either process or practice improvement project, um, which is presented by the hospitals, uh, presented to the hospital senior leader senior leaders and management. We have process improvement specialists within within the team, uh, sorry, within the trust. We are part of the Virginia Mason um, Institute, the VMI, um, Kaizen, uh, or Kaizen Hospital, um, and also their own line managers as well. Um, and it's uh, and that information, what they've helped develop is submitted then into the hospital's innovation portal um, to share with the wider hospital community. So there's a lot more learning all around um, and we can share the ideas and develop in other places that, you know, that they may not have thought of. Um, and then from here, really, at, at the end of this, um, they're, they're very balanced, they're very well prepared. Um, from here, they continue their journey to professional leadership roles then um, as sisters or charge nurses, um, if they wish, um, and because they're, they're, they're balanced. Um, they're exactly what we're looking for. The way this was prepared and written was to coach and mentor to the level expected rather than gather the information of what we think and pass on to them. So it's kind of tailored um, to get them to a spear point of, of they're ready and we know how ready they are. Um, and not only is, is it just, just nurses, but also within this program, we're also, it's also shared learning with allied health professionals and administrative staff as well. So they've got a really good opportunity there to share their experiences and multidisciplinary team, and they learn a lot from each other, actually. So running concurrently with this um, and supporting this journey, we have concurrent one-to-one -one support, uh, coaching and developmental mentoring again. Um, and also interview preparation, career direction support, which is um, the, the other part of my role here, um, and also other members of the team within the trust. Um, for those seeking change with the happy being staff nurses, they want to experience, they want to move, they want to gather new experience or, or a new speciality. We've um, introduced the staff nurse tra transfer process. So this is for early career nurses um, and also other staff nurses as well. Um, so they can move within, within their own nursing divisions without the need for applying for roles. Because one thing that well, after investigation, what, I, what, what we found, what I found was staff nurses were applying for roles of their of very similar to get the experience. They're unsuccessful and then they would leave. Again, not great for retention. Um, but also by, by doing this, it, it aids retention um, and provides uh, the further professional investment and opportunities. Um, and then on offer uh, to newly qualified and early career nurses, this is specifically for them, 
um, is uh, run a career prospects workshop uh, that allows the exploration, investigation, and development opportunities. Uh, listening to peer success stories. Um, so all the a, a lot of my student uh, students colleagues peers um, that have come onto my courses then they're then trained and then they um, have moved from newly qualified nurse early career nurse band five and then fairly rapidly band six band seven. So they're they're ward nurses themselves um, and uh, generally. Overseas as well, actually, um, got some very good colleagues, peers, who, who, and our friends who, who have taken this journey and uh, moved on for you know four years. Um, I moved from an early career nurse from overseas um, through to and now they're now running their own wards, which is for me is fabulous. Um, and for other people, it's a beautiful example of what actually can be achieved. Um, here, here they also meet the chief nurse, divisional heads of nursing. Um, as well as representatives from other specialist areas, so specialist nurses, um, where they can actually ask, how do I come into ITU, other specialist nurse areas? And then we also have career clinics for career pathway planning as well, um, and for any further preparation. And then come to the end, we also um, have introduced the career roadshow, which is fabulous, and it's an opportunity to get out and actually speak, see people right at the um, right at the front line. Um, so I'm able to take all the above information um, directly to those who can't attend because of work commitments, uh, and that's the thing. If people can't come to you, then you've got to think creatively, and we can then take it to them. And then underlying the whole of this journey is we have uh, a very committed team, uh, committed pastoral support uh, from our chaplaincy team. Um, senior and the clinical managers, the past development nurses, and we've also got dedicated staff members to support. Um, and we have a very one team approach um, within the organization here at, at Surrey and Sussex. So it's, it's trying to bring this all together, um, being supportive, um, and really giving people the best opportunity to, to develop and support them around the way that they're, they're free to develop as they wish. Um, and it's been very successful, um, really from early careers and uh, the, the early career nurses and the, and the newly qualified nurses, you know, they're, they're very, very happy, I, I believe. And they talk to me anyway. They always say that I are when they talk to me. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Amas. That was great. It was, I think, what I uh, love the most about them, the, the, the approach to that, that Sussex and uh, Surrey um, NHS Trust is following is just how it seems to involve so many different people. You know, just before we were talking about mentorship and that kind of a one to one, and you're actually talking something which is far more at an organizational level, and yet it's about mm. making them feel welcomed rather than, you know, having the feeling that you just joined this enormous monumental organization. So it has that, that effect of quite warm and quite protective, isn't it? Which is, yeah. which is so thank you, thank you very, very much for, for talking about that. Moving on to Jess, uh, Jess Sainsbury. Hello. Uh, hi, Jess. You're going to tell us a little bit about the RCN uh, newly registered nurses uh, network, I think. So over to you. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yep. Fabulous. Thank hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, Thank you so much for um, having the, the network to speak to you guys today. So the focus of this br very brief presentation is on um, early career leaders, surprise, surprise, both nursing students and newly registered nurses. I'll introduce you to the Royal College of Nursing's newly registered nurses network, um, talk a bit about the importance of peer support little bit about clinical supervision and finally how you can connect with us no matter where you are in the world but I'll start with very briefly introducing myself so you know who's talking at you. <laughs> um, so I'm currently working at the Florence Nightingale Foundation. I'm on a secondment um, from my home trust and I'm working as a research and policy assistant leading on a project to set up strategic multi-professional so not just nursing um, student shared decision making councils across the southeast of England with the hope to create a model that other regions nations can um, pick up and create that strong needed student voice within their local health systems 
Um, before nursing, I worked in human resources um, and I'm now studying part time for a master's in global health um, with health professions education because I've got a special interest in um, human resources for help for health. Sorry. Um, but I like to deliver sessions on the professional use of social media, which has come up from our other speakers as well, um, and just encouraging students and new registrants to make the most of the national and global network that's available to them within nursing. Now, the reason why I'm here today is to talk about the RCN's newly registered nurses network and pushing forward the importance of early career nurses being not only heard, um, but encouraged and empowered right from the start of their careers. So um, the NRN network, as we like to call it, um, is essentially it's an online peer support network run by early career nurses for early career nurses. We are primarily based on Twitter, on social media, but we also have a Facebook page um, to share resources, which is open um, and links and we may be about to branch out to Instagram as well. So you guys have heard that first here today, but you can find us at RCN NRN and I'll, I'll share those tags after in the chat for those of you. Um, but this, this Twitter page, um, it will be coming up to a year old next month. Um, and the community that has been built as a result of it has been absolutely incredible. There's definitely been something missing when it comes to ensuring that those at the early stages of their career are both supported and heard. Um, and we believe that this network is a small part of the solution. So Twitter is a, is a public platform. So we engage with early career nurses from wherever they are in the world, as well as established nurses, um, student nurses as well, um, importantly, transitioning to registered nurse and anyone else who wants to, to be completely honest. We've got a curator team of 16 um, and we're made up of students who are in the last six months of their education programme in the UK um, and also uh, early career nurses in a variety of settings um, and with different parts of the UK registration. So we um, have specialists, so you could have adult mental health, paediatric or learning disabilities nurses. So we've got a good mix um, of backgrounds to make sure that we um, provide a good support to the people that engage with us. Um, but I must say that they are a, a wonderful bunch of humans um, and it's so lovely to, to work with them. So we, we strongly believe, surprise, surprise, that having a peer support network is vital for early career nurses to not only feel integrated into the team that they're based with, um, but also to have that sense of belonging within the profession as per Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It always comes back to that, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, but having a network, it not only unites you with others, but it gives you that strong voice as well. It helps with that annoying inner critic and the imposter syndrome that everyone experiences and it doesn't go away, I've been told. <laughs> but in addition, the experience of newly registered nurses um, from the end of 2019 onwards has been different. Um, different because we've we've been out there with everyone else in this global pandemic. So we must not forget that these early career nurses need support to adjust to nursing in non-COVID times as well and adjusting to a new normal. And people are sharing their experiences at different stages of transition. It's another transition phase again. So we are there to, to hear people, um, to, yeah, just to make them feel heard and know that they're not alone. So one of the agendas um, that we are driving forward alongside other established nurses um, is the, the need for good clinical supervision. So this involves education of the difference between managerial education and clinical supervision, but also campaigning for protected time. So clinical supervision is important no matter where you nurse in the world. So please do get in touch if this is something you're interested in getting involved with and see how um, we can help each other to, to have this important part of our practice. So I told you, I hope I kept a time. <laughs> but if you would like to um, get in touch with the network, I've included um, some of the, the handles up there. We also have a, a landing page on the RCN's website and the Facebook links there too. 
but um, it's been really nice to, to, to share what we're up to. Um, and we would love to network with other similar support systems and help people set up their own if that's something they're looking to create. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jess. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed with, with the, this network and with how dynamic you yourself and the network are and that you think beyond what's happening in the UK uh, for newly registered nurses, but that you're saying, you know, let's hear other people. And if you want to share stories with others, uh, the same instances, that that option is there as well. I think I think that's fantastic. And I think that's what's really needed. And the other thing as well is that we're talking about, uh, you know, the role and how we can support uh, uh, newly registered nurses. Um, it's I, I think it's really important to um, kind of distinguish what it means to support and and guide and to be patronizing. I think that sometimes we can jump into that role um, uh, inadvertently. And, and it's just really good to see how dynamic and how much energy and knowledge and skills you are also bringing uh, to hospitals and clinics when you join a team, right? Exactly. Uh, that yes, clinical supervision is needed and so on and so forth. There is so much that you're bringing on, uh, into services, which is hugely appreciated. So, so thank you very, very much for, for, for sharing uh, your story and the story of the network. Um, moving on to Uganda, Harriet, are you there? I can't see you. Harriet? Don't know if Harriet can... Harriet, you can. Hi, there you are. Yes. Harriet, hi. Um, hi. You're a midwife and you're the founder of Milcott, which is an extraordinary organization. So uh, over to you, tell us about, about your work. Thank you very much, Joe. Let me share my screen and then I introduce myself. Sure. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Nursing Now, for this great opportunity. My name is Naiga Harriet. I'm a midwife from Uganda. I'm the director of Midwife Led Community Transformation. I'm a young, innovative midwife with Nursing Now Global Campaign, and I'm a champion of Nightingale Challenge. Uh, I'm leading a community based organization called Midwife Led Community Transformation that brings a model of bridging the gap which exists between the midwife and the local community through provision of sexually productive health and rights to marginalize the adolescents and young adults. Uh, well, this model has been uh, identified and has been profiled on a number of occasions. And I believe that it is changing healthcare and it is inspiring many nurses and midwives on different platforms where I share. Uh, according to the feedback that I got, I get. Well, this is a, a new and uh, trending article that excited me, that humbled me, where I was honored when Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Cambridge, interviewed me about uh, the work that I do, and especially about the Nightingale Challenge. And I'm so grateful to Nursing Now for this and I'm really using it to inspire the nurses and midwives because I know that it is for the work that I do, it is for the people that I serve. I have provided a link for anyone who can be, who is on this platform, who can uh, go ahead and find out my story so that you get inspired. I believe we have Ale career nurses uh, on this webinar. So I'm saying that everyone has an opportunity to do something to bring a difference in nursing and midwifery. And this is the right time. When I, 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 when I think about the way back when I was newly qualified, uh, life is too tough, especially in that developing world. When you get out, nurses and midwives, uh, I can talk about my experience here in Uganda. You feel that you are, 
you do not have any opportunity. Everyone can come and just give you peanut to work a lot, but giving you very little. You are stranded, you don't know what to do, but I want to let the early career nurses and midwives that you are qualifying in a new era of COVID-19, which has brought very many challenges in health, of which us, the nurses and midwives, have the full potential to identify them and then identify the solutions. At the Nightingale, when the Nightingale Challenge came, I, I took courage, I and my team took courage to sign up. Uh, it uh, being focusing on providing leadership uh, development for nurses and midwives, and it believes that uh, supporting nurse-led services enables them to practice to their full potential. And this, I myself am an example, having been supported by budget trust for nursing to implement our Nightingale Challenge, we are seeing that it is impacting more communities and it is seen as a, a, a model that is going to change healthcare. So if it wasn't supported, if I wasn't supported, that means it wouldn't have come to the light to impact. What does our Nightingale Challenge project focus on? It's aiming at building resilience of midwives and nurses in providing effective and efficient preventive and responsive service delivery. Uh, having noticed that uh, nurses and midwives are more concentrated in the healthy facilities and yet in our communities, this is where the challenges come from. This is where people are suffering healthy challenges and we are staying with them in the communities, but we just move out and go to health facilities where they even fail to come, or even when they come because of large numbers, they don't get satisfactory care. So this uh, Nightingale challenge is to build resilience of nurses and midwives to gain confidence in assessing communities. What are healthy challenges that, that are in the communities, especially around sexual reproductive health among adolescents and young adults living in marginalized communities? As such, we trained nurses and midwives from six healthy facilities, which we identified in our community. And this uh, entail both government and private healthy facilities. We trained them in leadership, uh, we train them in leadership, healthcare leadership, adolescent friendly healthy services, mental health, and also inspiring them and motivating them. Uh, we brought them a team of different professionals from various uh, careers where they learned from. And at the moment, these nurses and midwives are giving us testimonies, how they were inspired, uh, how they were motivated to go to the grassroots to provide the services to assess the communities. As you can see in the pictures, those are some of our Nightingale Challenge training events that we had. And uh, we, we, we finished our Nightingale Challenge project activities this last month. And right now we are compiling reports from the different nurses and midwives and working together with different uh, stakeholders. Milcott Nightingale Challenge project has been highly recognized in our community as being impactful. And we have managed to work with a number of stakeholders. Those are, those are organizations and the healthy facilities. And they can't wait to work with us even along as we enter into the Nursing Now Challenge. So when we trained the nurses and midwives, we allocated them in the communities, in the hotspot areas around the healthy facilities so that we can mentor them on how to assess community and how to approach the marginalized adolescents and young adults, especially the key populations who fear, who feel that there is grave discrimination among them to go to the healthy facilities. So nurses and midwives have been able to go to the communities, assess 
approach the, the marginalized adolescents and young adults, as you can see in this picture below, a nurse was sitting with was seated with adolescents and young adults, and they were listening to what she had for them. She was providing sexually reproductive health information, and they had a lot, a lot of questions that we had to answer. And then the picture above, those are a team, that is a team of nurses and midwives, doctors, counselors, uh, counseling psychologists, and then village health, health teams, managers of organizations that we partnered with, and they are so excited about the Nightingale Challenge and working with Milcourt as a new model of care. We were able to provide HIV screening and counseling, STD screening and testing, cervical cancer screening, mental health, because these marginalized adolescents and young adults face a lot of mental health challenges that no one is caring to screen or to give extra care. So they were able to be cancelled and also provided them with referrals. Well, as uh, it's deep inside within my heart that as nurses and midwives, we should be the champions for communities. Nurses and midwives, while are practicing in facilities, they, are, or they have a huge workload, they have families to care for, they do not think about uh, going down to the community. And so in our Nightingale Challenge program, we have been able to, to build their confidence to approach the community. And they are now saying, yes, we can do it. So we built them to be community champions. And it's really amazing. Even the results that they are providing are amazing. So I want to say thank you so much, uh, the organizers of this webinar. I'm always grateful to share with the nurses and midwives to learn from my journey, to learn from my experience. And one thing that I can tell them is that have the courage to do something. It's when you do something, when other, then you will be seen. You cannot be seen when you are there failing to take a step. I got an opportunity to have a chat with Joe, and he was telling me about his journey to start a, the mental health initiative that he's doing. And it was really an amazing story. It all stems from realizing that where you are, it is not well. There are challenges. And who is to solve these challenges for you? That means it is you. It is you. Do not wait for others to come. Us being the largest uh, composition of profession in healthcare, that means we are in position to solve these challenges, working along with other professionals. Thank you very much. Harriet. Thank you. And this is a conversation that I really look forward to continue to having with you. You know, this is this is not the first time that uh, we hear your story or that I hear your story. We had that conversation and we are going to continue that conversation next week. Um, but but it's true, you know, it's it's true that everyone can can start something. We can we can be agents of change, but it's also important to recognize that some of us will work in much more challenging environments than others and i think that uh, you, you know how you started and the environment where you started was very challenging and that's why i think that your story is also so inspiring and i and i hope that it is inspiring as well for other people who are in parts of the world where maybe resources are limited but that will that that potential that vision is there you know and i think that's why also your story is so so inspirational so thank you for sharing that story again i'm very aware of time i'm not being a very good moderator i should be kind of cutting you and telling you okay we have to move on but i just think that the stories are so interesting that i just can't do it i just can't ask you uh, to stop all of you uh, but uh, with that let's move to 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 the next speaker um charlotte charlotte jacob hall um, safe care specialist nurse and chief and nurse um, fellow from Gloucestershire Hospital uh, NHS Trust. Hi Charlotte. Hi, thanks for having me. Happy International Nurses Day. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen then. Feel free to cut me down if you need to. <laughs> okay. 
So yes, you've introduced me. Um, I will introduce what I'm here to present, which is Gloucester's Gloucestershire Hospital Staff Transition and Retention Support Network. So we are early career nurses and allied health professionals supporting newly registered nurses and beyond. So uh, on completion of our organisation's preceptorship programme, myself and my colleague Sophie, that you can see pictured in the top left there, decided that actually more needed to be done in terms of ongoing support and mentoring for our workforce. Uh, we felt that there was a gap, a big gap. Uh, and although we were lucky enough to actually have experienced a preceptorship programme, because not many people do get that, um, we recognised that there was more that could be done. Um, and so we co-founded the Gloucestars Network. Uh, the idea itself was influenced by the STAR project, uh, which was funded by the Bernadette Trust actually uh, for nursing. Uh, it was managed by Dr. Jane Ray and um, a team from the University of Hull. We kind of had conversations with her to start our idea and kind of flourish it from there. So I think it's important to mention that this is sort of a, a three year project. We're in our third year now. Um, and actually it's mostly in the majority of it been volunteered time and work. So I've got a little video for you and I want to share it with you because it's the quickest way of me summarising um, exactly what Gloucestars is all about. So I'll just make sure the sound's on. Here we go. Charlotte, we Charlotte, we, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear the sound of the yeah. video. Oh, um, can you hear me there now? You are. There you are, yes. Oh, you didn't hear the sound of the video. Well, that's disappointing because it's highly infectious. <laughs> well, there was no there's no talking, it's just a little jingle, which is really quite uh, addictive. <laughs> so uh, I'll just make sure that you can see my screen now. Is that okay? Yes. Perfect. Uh, okay, so um, unfortunately, I'm not able to share any of the data with you today, so it isn't time to do that, but I'd be happy to share it with anybody who wants to talk to us after the session. Uh, so we've launched two different types of guardians within our network. So we've got the preceptorship guardian, uh, and the preceptorship guardian is basically somebody who has just been through the preceptorship process. So they're just going through their time as a transition from student to a newly registered professional. Uh, and it was really important for us because Sophie and I, for example now we're, we're three years in we're still very much early career nurses but we're no longer able to to be relevant essentially to those people going through that process right now we acknowledge and recognize that 
things change very quickly in the nursing world uh, and that's a good thing but we should reflect that in the way that we support people so we have perception guardians who basically become a guardian once they've qualified from the perception program and then they undertake the support for the perceptees coming in so we're always renewing and refreshing and making sure that the right people are there for advice and that leads me on to our second type of guardian. So this guardian is a specialist guardian. Now, the idea of a specialist guardian is they're there for your next steps in your career. They're there to enhance opportunities in your specialties that you might be interested in. So we're very much talking about coaching, mentoring, sponsorship, uh, all these different types of levels and values that can come from expertise within the organization. So if you're interested in infection control, we've got a guardian. If you're interested in acute medicine, we've got a guardian. If you want to know more about uh, the Bain community and how you can progress in, in uh, pieces of work that are ongoing, we have a guardian for that. And that's the idea of specialist guardians. So this is just some of the work that we've uh, kind of done recently, which I think is important to share, uh, even though we can't give the sort of research that led us to this. So we've, you said in the video actually, that we uh, released a pin badge on Glostar's Guardians, the Perceptorship Programme. So the idea of this pin is that you wear it during the Perceptorship, and this allows you to sort of acknowledge openly that you're undertaking this uh, facilitated learning, uh, and that you might just wanna ask a few more questions. And it's worked really well uh, for our Guardians, because it provokes conversation. Oh, I so when I, you know, I work across sites in my work, so I go to various different areas. And if I see somebody wearing this pin badge, immediately it starts a conversation, immediately it sparks a uh, discussion. And that's the important part, to feel valued, recognized, noticed. Uh, and so that was really important for us. And then that led us into another piece of work, which we just released this week, actually, called uh, the I Am New Here badge. Uh, this badge is for literally everybody. So we've just expanded our network to allied health professionals and beyond. And ultimately, we recognize that um, not only do we need to be there to help flourish newly uh, qualified people, uh, newly, uh, newly you know, sorry, new starters and new jobs. What we want to do is recognize people who actually are developing their careers within the organization and beyond as well. So this I'm new here badge is about acknowledging uh, experienced nurses, uh, but they're new to an area or new to a specialty or even new to a role. So it might be that you've been promoted to a ward manager, but you've been on that unit for 10 years but that's a very different role. And it's acknowledging that learning process and sort of uh, encouraging the ability to say, well, actually I, I do get the chance to explore these new uh, ways of working. Um, so I'll stop there because I know you're short for time, but if we do have any questions or feedback, we always welcome uh, questions and feedback. Um, and also if, there's anybody who wants to sort of collaborate or partnership. So our, our bigger aim in the long term is that we think that this kind of network should be um, a tool that's utilized throughout organizations uh, across the world, actually. Uh, and that things like this should be in place for people. And we, we really want to reiterate that message of having a global manifesto to help everybody flourish at all levels of their career. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Thank you for your presentation. Um, lots of comments on the comments box saying how much they love not just what you're doing but their name I mean the name is just great Gloucester is it's just it's just great and and I loved especially when you were talking about the specialist guardians I think that is a fantastic idea the badges as well so many really simple but obviously really effective ideas just to bring people together and help them through uh, at this stage thank you for, for for going so quickly as well that was that was uh, really helpful um Last but not least, really excited as well to hear from uh, Leticia, Leticia Ola in Spain. Um, right, Leticia, there you are. <laughs> Leticia, can you tell us a little bit about an example of um, working in a country where that module of supporting early, uh, uh, career nurses doesn't necessarily exist, right? Over to you. Yeah, exactly. So hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today. My name is Leticia and I'm a nurse in Madrid, Spain. I'm going to speak about my experience working in Spain without support and afterwards working in UK within a mentorship program. I have to say I've been listening to the panelists and taking a lot of notes because it sounds amazing and very inspiring. And as you say, here in Spain, we don't have yet any formal model to support to support newly qualified nurses, although many of us think that this 
extremely important to have it. Here, when we finish the university, we start to work wherever a nurse is need, usually with short contracts for days, weeks, or months, if we are lucky, and in different units, without being able to choose where do we want to work and without a formal mentor or a mentoring program. There are some hospitals here in Spain that have developed some welcome guides or that do welcome meetings, especially in summer, where a lot of new nurses start to work. And they give there some general information about the hospital, but only one hospital that I found is in the last few years has developed a plan to support new, nurse, new nurses through uh, an online training. And now is planning to start with a new program where nurses are starting to work in specific areas like ITU will have a mentor for a few days, but most hospital doesn't give any support. And this affects patient safety and the quality of care, and also is very stressful for nurses and doesn't help with retention either. I still remember, for example, the day that I decided to go to UK to work, that day they left me alone in my first shift in a neurology ward with only a healthcare assistant that was new to the service also. And we spent all the shift running up and down with patients coming and going to surgery, with patients in pain, with the irrigation fluids that uh, we have to change constantly and so on. So that day was really hard and I went, went home really worried because although I did my best, I wasn't sure about if I maybe made a mistake that could have consequence to my patients. Then I decided that I didn't want to work like that anymore. So two months later, I was moving to London. When I started to work in UK, I saw the difference between having a support and training when you start to work in a service or not having it and how important it is. And this is not only because I felt safer and as a member of a team, but also because I have time to learn about my patient's needs. I have time to read the protocols, search and learn the evidence behind the practice and to see how my mentor was working and ask her a lot of questions. So when I finished this period, I still felt new in the service, but I was confident to do my work and that really came and to ready to give my patients a high quality care. And I also realized that this period is very important to decide about what I wanted to do with my career. Because having a mentor that explained you how the unit is organized and that introduced you many nurses in different roles helps you to think how do you want to develop your career. So if you want to go for a leadership position, for example, you can have an idea from the beginning on how to do it and what do you need to achieve this while here in Spain without support and having to change constantly from one unit to another, this is very difficult and they can take many years. I think the lack of support in our career mm -hmm. in Spain is related to our working conditions and also to the understanding that people have here about what is nursing, especially politicians and decision makers from the healthcare system, because it seems that they think that any nurse can work with any kind of patients without making a difference in the quality of care or in the patient outcomes. And that's not true. That's only that they don't really understand the value of nursing. So that's why I think that campaigns of nurses and nursing now or nurses together are so important because it helps us to find the way, the way to explain how important is our work and why our working conditions need to change. So just to finish, I want to say thank you to everyone that has been involved in this campaign. And I hope we meet again in a few years to talk, to talk about our improvements and to plan more challenge for the future. Thank you very much. Leticia, thank you very much for, for, for telling us about your experience um, here in Spain. Uh, being myself in Spain at the moment, not necessarily as a resident, <laughs> but I had contact with healthcare services here. I always, I have to say that I'm always so impressed with how professional people are here uh, throughout clinical service. So as I was listening to your story, I was just thinking the immense potential that people will have if they had that extra support that you were talking about that is needed right because definitely the quality is there 
it's just helping people just to go a little bit further and and help them to blossom even more isn't it so so i'm, I'm really excited to talk to you as well we have to continue this conversation leticia um <laughs> Thank you very much to all our speakers. Um, we definitely um, have gone over time, but I hope that everybody's comfortable to, to continue and, and staying with us because now we will have a panel discussion for really fantastic people, great advocates for, uh, uh, for, for nurses and midwives, um, a panel discussion on how we can use the international attention and support that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has brought to the nursing profession? How can we use this to drive the nursing leadership agenda? Um, and I'll start uh, asking this question to the four of you, but maybe I'll start with, with Billy, Billy Rosa in, in New York. Can you hear us, Billy? Yes, I have you, how are you? Hi there, hi. Tell us a little bit about your work and what, how, what do you think of, of kind of this, this, this theme of, of how we can use this very difficult situation that everybody's been experiencing over the past 12 months to actually help to uh, uh, drive this nursing uh, leadership agenda? Sure. So, yes, yeah, so thanks for having me and happy International Nurses Day to everyone. Um, so I'm a psycho-oncology postdoctoral research fellow in New York. Um, and, and as I'm listening, you know, two things really come to mind. Um, one is really building the health and well-being of the workforce, I think. Um, so, you know, especially for new career nurses, really emphasizing how important it is if we're going to have a sustained career, if we're going to be of service in the long term, if we're going to be able to maximize our talents, um, that we need to address again and again and again the well-being of our workforce, including the mental well-being, the emotional well-being, the physical well-being, right? And, and as I've discussed with some people on this call, the, the term resilience has become a little bit of a, um, let's say, overvalued phrase at times because it really places the burden of well-being on the nurse. And so I think one of the ways we need to start looking at it is how we hold our systems accountable for changing cultures and improving services that really allow nurses to enhance well-being, access uh, assistance for their own, um, their own health, and really be able to foster communities of nurses where people can share their stories, they can feel heard and seen and acknowledged in the, in the stressful environments that they work in, um, and they can really make tangible change. Um, and I think the other thing that comes to mind is really uh, the notion of advocacy. Uh, I talk about this again and again and again, but I don't see a lot of advocacy training for nurses um, as kind of integral to their training and education. And so if we could imagine for a moment, you know, what it would look like if 28 million nurses around the world who constitute 60% of the health workforce were actually trained as advocates, right? So trained to advance policy for health equity, trained to um, really sit with multi-sector stakeholders, with policymakers, to kind of be able to merge the data that they know, right? The evidence base that they're so familiar with, but also the stories from the bedside. I mean, nurses are in this incredibly unique position to really uh, bear witness to the human experience and to be able to help people understand what is needed to alleviate suffering and improve health and well-being. So I think by improving the health and well-being of the nursing workforce, but also em empowering and equipping nurses to engage in real advocacy. I think we can really help new nurses and help the workforce in general to feel that they are really a part of the change, that they're really of value in that, um, in that leadership agenda. Thank you very much, Billy. And thank you, first of all, for uh, introducing your role as well, which is something I forgot to ask you to do. And I'll ask that to uh, the other three panelists as well. I think you've mentioned such important things, a mental health, the mental well-being of, of nurses and healthcare staff in general, and that kind of advocacy training, especially thinking about the audience that we have with us today, and of uh, many nurses working in a extremely fixed hierarchical structures where nurses are not used to having a voice. Uh, and, and that advocacy training is so important so that they can have that common voice and directly or indirectly probably will benefit as well their mental well-being and their kind of the satisfaction that they will 
take from from their jobs and from being nurses, right? So, so really, really yeah. important points you made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just put in a quick plug. Um, uh, there is a new international policy report being released uh, that I worked on with um, Charlotte McArdle, the chief nurse of Northern Ireland, Professor Sir Mike Michael Marmot, who's uh, really the global social determinants expert. Um, and we put forth 76 recommendations across six domains of nursing to assist nurses in tackling the social determinants of health and achieving health equity. And um, two, one of those aspects is nurses as advocates. So what can international organizations, national associations, and individual nurses do to really advance nurse advocacy? But the other is uh, like we were just talking about, like really holding healthcare systems and organizations accountable as employers and commissioners uh, that really create environments for nurse safety and well-being. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That is really And great. that'll be launched May 19th. I was going to ask you, where is that going to be available and when then? Okay, great. You just answer that. Um, okay, I'm seeing Sipora Iregi right in front of me. Sipora, so I'll, I'll ask you the same, the same panel question that I've asked Billy. Um, how can we use uh, this situation, this international attention and support that COVID-19 has brought to the nursing profession? to drive the nursing leadership agenda? How can we maximize this very unfortunate moment in, in the history of our planet, really, for the benefit of nurses? Um, thank you so much for that question. I think I just want to say what an honor it is to be on this panel today. And I hope that you can hear me as well. We can hear you, we can hear you. Now we couldn't at the beginning, now we can. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I really like the discussion that was already there before on how to support young nurses. And I think I would feel light bulbs just light up in my head as people are talking. And I wish that that is something I had gone through um, when I was leaving nursing school and joining um, practice uh, per se in Kenya today. Um, I think to answer your question, um, Nursing Now and Nightingale Challenge, um, that program that has gone on from 2019 has really built the momentum for nurses. Um, and I think now with COVID-19, that just served to elevate the voice of nurses, um, to shine a brighter light on what nurses do um, in regard to providing quality care for patients and also in the role they play in ensuring that healthcare is delivered um, to every person who needs it. Um, and I think as a young nurse, um, working through COVID-19 has showed a lot of, um, you know, I would call them health system flaws um, that really do not work in support for the nurses. Um, we had strikes in different nations in my country. We had one, um, you know, nurses just shedding a light on what it means to be a nurse. You know, there were conditions that they're forced to work in um, in their life per se and how it is affected by the work they do. Um, and I think um, moving forward, you know, to drive the leadership agenda, it would be important to um, to keep at it now that I already said that the nursing now build a momentum. It would be important for us as young nurses to keep the conversation going. And I think as young nurses, the greatest platform that we are learning to use or have used in the past um, is the social media. And you know, um, the social media um, gives us a platform to connect with nurses all around the globe so that now we can build a global community in advancing the agenda to improve nursing and health, um, even as we lobby for more leadership positions. And I think also the social media platform helps uh, to give us a platform to share our stories. And I think a lot of that has been going on through the years. Uh, we have seen the media also get involved um, and uh, other news platforms, other people who write blogs, the government just um, you know, highlighting the stories of nurses and the success stories of what they have been able to achieve even with COVID um, before and after, you know, and also just sharing our stories on how we are able to change the communities, how we are able to impact health and impact the society, even as we work with individual patients and with the community at large. And I think um, the social media also gives us a global reach. You know, um, I would not have thought when I was beginning my nursing school that I would be on a platform like this, um, sharing my thoughts and sharing my, uh, you know, my story, sharing who I am as I am nurse and how I got here. And I think um, that would be one of the greatest platforms we can use. And I think what we need to do now is keep sharing those stories. I think we have seen a lot of nurses 
uh, do so much with COVID, build solutions that are sustainable and that are strategic um, in driving the agenda to improve health, you know, and in achieving universal health coverage for all. Um, and I think data plays a major part of it. Um, governments have started listening to the voice of nurses. They have started listening to the healthcare worker. Um, they have started sharing platforms with them, inviting them for meetings, you know, having those round table discussions with them. And I think it would be adequate for us as nurses to keep doing the research to keep at it collecting data you know um, even as we say we would like to be paid better we would like to have better working conditions we'd like more staff in the hospitals to facilitate you know the provision of care then we have the data to back that um, in in the spirit also of evidence-based practice um, and I think slowly by slowly, now that the momentum has already been built, now that we have already, you are already sharing those platforms with the leaders, um, both in health and in the government, then we need to use these platforms to keep that conversation going, to not stop, um, to keep knocking on their doors because they are listening now. Um, and now we need to maximize on that attention, even as we build um, on to build a better future for health and nursing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sephora. It's it's really encouraging to hear that in countries like Kenya and probably in other parts of Africa as well, that nurses are finally being invited to sit at the table. Uh, it's unfortunate that COVID-19, this terrible situation that we're in, has kind of you know made us more visible, but at the same time, we have to maximize the fact that we are sitting at the table, that we are getting uh, politicians and, and decision makers' attention and start addressing other issues that influence our careers and our lives as well, isn't it? So it's it's really encouraging to hear that. Thank you for sharing your story. And hopefully there will be more of these kind of webinars to hear more stories like yours. Uh, and I really look forward to that. Now, last but not least, we um, have time still to hear Ariani, Ariani Pertiwi. Um, the same question to you um, in terms of how can we use the situation that we've been experiencing over the past 12 months and that has brought so much attention not just a pandemic, but to the role of nurses. How can we use that to drive the nursing leadership agenda? Right. Thank you, Joe. So, um, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Ariani. I'm now a young faculty member here in a public university in Indonesia. So, I think it's real. This COVID nineteen pandemic, in my opinion, gives a unique opportunity to the nurses, especially in my country, and maybe also in other developing countries. Uh, with the speed of social media, people use, easily get news from all over the world, no exception about nurses in, the, in developed countries like nurses, for example, in the US, in the UK, where, where people there have high trust, that's what I know, uh, have high trust to the nurses. The news about good nurses there, how the news reported the important roles of nurses in those countries, how they tell the stories about notable nurses can help public in my setting understand that nurses really do help people, not only receive instruction and have no autonomy. And also I would like to thanks really, uh, and I'm really grateful for this global movement by Nursing Now. It helps us really to communicate the importance of nurses. For me personally, this gave me more confidence to speak and do things in the community. Um, as nurses community, I think one thing that we can do is spreading this good news, um, the important role of nurses. In the same time, of course, make also good news from our local um, by doing our best in serving the community. And I have been listened to all of the speakers before, and I, I really love the idea of um, supporting new qualified nurses that unfortunately I don't really have that in my setting. Um, so what um, Dr. Ray Dula mentioned about the structure mentorship and preceptorship program for newly qualified nurses, it's like a really wonderful ideas that now I'm thinking to really want to bring that up in my setting to really support um, the newly qualified nurses here in Indonesia. So um, what we do to, you know, um, to use this uh, COVID-19 pandemic to bring the nursing agenda is um, to be 
card and joining the nursing association it's really important for newly qualified nurses because uh, in my opinion we as a newly qualified nurses we do not have um, enough power yet and we do not have enough experience yet so by joining this uh, nursing association we are becoming the part of the movement and we got the information will be part of the agenda and um, government now start to listen to nurses and nursing association because of this COVID pandemic because you know we all of us understand that uh, this COVID pandemic, there are many aspects in this pandemic that no single one profession can handle themselves, right? So this is real opportunity for nurses. Be smart and thoughtful on what your community needs and do something on that. Just be brave for newly qualified nurses. Because, you know, um, the public is not used to viewing nurses as leaders. So just, and but this pandemic uh, in my opinion gave the opportunity for us nurses to just be brave and speak and they will listen and they will see whatever we can do and this is really important for uh, nurses to grow in uh, my setting thank you Ariane, thank you thank you very much i think you've made a really you know important point by saying that the public is not used to seeing us as leaders i would go even a little bit further and say that sometimes nurses ourselves are not used to seeing ourselves as leaders exactly uh, everyone that has joined this panel today proves the opposite and that's why exactly in uh, so exciting so thank you very much for for your for your intervention also really exciting to hear that in indonesia like in kenya and so many other places government nurses are starting to be invited to sit at the table again with policy makers and and the government so very exciting news um unfortunately we don't have time for for questions with you know for uh, 12 past four in the uk so uh, and probably much later in many other places so um i can only say thank you very much to all speakers, uh, all panel uh, members, uh, like I was saying, all examples of, of uh, leadership and of the potentials that nurses have in influencing the global agenda. Um, I hope uh, we can continue this conversation. Uh, I'm sure that there will be many more webinars that, like you were just saying now, uh, Ariane, the potential of uh, social uh, connections of using networks like this is huge. So let's continue this conversation let's continue to move forward and happy international nurses day to to everyone so thank you very much thank you joe thank you everyone bye bye take care everyone thank you thank you for joining bye